Tom Kelly is the Chief Executive Officer at HealthSmart. Mr. Kelly joined HealthSmart in August of 2014 to continue to de develop and execute HealthSmart's mission. Uh, as you know, Mr. Kelly has extensive uh, experience in healthcare related issues and has a lot of good advice for us today. Many of you have seen the app. So without further ado, let's welcome Tom Kelly. So good morning. Pretty, pretty hard act to follow. I've, I've, uh, I, do, I do business with Adam for very good reasons. I think he gave you those. And uh, uh, pretty dynamic speaker. And then I had this whole presentation done about trolls, and I had to throw it out after yesterday. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to give you a diff put a different picture in your mind. Here's the hospital. Who, who's the hospital business? The hospital business is Jack Nicholson and a few good men going, you can't handle the truth. right? And that is overwhelmingly what the business is about today. I'm not going to tell you because you can't handle it. And I'm Peter Finch in network, standing, leaning out the window going, I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. So, <laughs> so, so that's the premise for this morning's meeting, is to talk about what, what's, and we're going to do, I'm going to do kind of a big picture of the healthcare business and what's happening in it. But ultimately, we're really faced with two choices. Many of you have looked at all this kind of ACO junk that's around the country today. One of the most endearing things that Medicare does is they sprinkle money all over the place and let people try things. Right? So ACO money is one of the more recent adventures they've had. Almost all of these sprinkling money adventures fail miserably. But really tough thing to do to take somebody who's way too expensive and then give them money to think about being less expensive. But that fundamentally is, that that's the CMS approach to solving this problem. <laughs> the other alternative is to say, listen, I'm going to figure out every which way not to walk through those doors. Right? I'm going to do whatever I have to do not to use services that are too expensive. So first, I've got to get smart about that. Second, I've got to find where I can go for those services. Third, I've got to keep myself in good enough shape that I actually don't have to walk through those doors, right? And, uh, and that really is the only solution we have, right? If you really think about it, uh, hospitals are the biggest unregulated mon monopoly in the United States. And every day, they're concentrating their interest. So what do we fight about with hospitals? They want to they come to town, buy up all the surgery centers and the imaging centers, raise all their prices so they're just as expensive as the hospital prices, and not give people any options. And the fact is, the DOJ and the FTC don't seem to care about that one bit. Right? You're a little bit lucky here in Oklahoma City because you don't have, you have two 600-pound gorillas instead of just one 800-pound gorilla. That gives a little bit of competition in the market, not nearly as much as you'd like. Uh, but the fact is, I, I live in Dallas. It's the home of the original 800-pound gorilla, Baylor Hospital. Right? What are Baylor's rules? You can't tell anybody what our prices are. By the way, if you sign up an employer group, they have to agree also not to tell anybody what the prices are. And all I do is, and you'll see this later on when, uh, when Mike O'Neill comes up, we show them Blue Book, show them the range of prices in Dallas, and they say, but Baylor's not here, but don't worry, they're way over here. So you get a range of prices, which is already way too big, and all you do is go way to the right if you want to think about what Baylor's price is going to be if you go there. And they get the picture, so I don't have to talk about their specific prices. So where's, where's the healthcare business going? First, the, the, if you looked at the thing that the best thing that's happened in healthcare in the past 10 or 15 years is the focus on quality. Just think about, think about the number of errors in hospitals, surgical errors, uh, bad administration of drugs, either too much or the wrong drug, uh, uh, hospital-acquired infections. All these problems were rampant 10 years ago. Right? And in fact, I, I still, it almost pains me, but I've, I've had at least a dozen situations in which a hospital administrator explained to me some of our most profitable patients are mistakes. And I say, I'll just pretend I didn't hear that, right? I mean, just, but that is exactly that. And the, the fact is, why, why do hospitals not want to bundle? because they basically have to promise quality and predictable outcomes. It hurts them, but the fact is, same, same reason, 
You want a price from somebody and a warranty when you buy a car, why? Because if they didn't tell you the truth, then they ought to fix it for free, right? So, uh, so quality accountability is a good thing, and when I, well, I pick on CMS a lot about some of the things they do, the fact is they've done a lot of good stuff around quality accountability over this 10 years, and we need to latch on to that as aggressively as we can. Uh, the parent consolidation, uh, really all, all, it, all it pretends, I think, for all of us is a less flexible, more expensive market. It's the only thing that ever comes out of consolidation, right? It's, it's you have fewer, less price competition. Uh, you've got more concentration of interest. You've got more bureaucracy. You get less likelihood that you're really going to have a responsive, uh, a responsive uh, company to deal with. Uh, private exchanges are here. Probably a big thing, and we'll talk a little bit about this, is how do we use exchanges to actually mitigate our own risk? Because the way I look at, look at an exchange is, you know, I have 1,500 employees spread across the country. Do I really want to take insurance risk in New York City? Probably not, right? And I can use the exchange to avoid doing that. So, uh, Transparency, it's ultimately all about that. We're going, to go, we're going to go from Oklahoma City. We've been working with Keith and his crew. Fabulous bunch of people have done wonderful work for, for our members and customers. Uh, and we're going to go from one city to 10 cities as of December 31st in terms of offering uh, transparent price networks. And my goal is to be at 30 markets the following year. So, uh, and the last thing we're going to talk about is consumerism because it ultimately this is all about making this work just like any other business. Just imagine going to Walmart, having no price posted, going to the register, having them tell you that, well, that's $10,000, and you go, but I've got a coupon. They say, okay, it's a buck sixty-five. Quality accountability, the, the stuff that CMS has done, and all of us have latched on to this, is, is really good stuff, and it's greatly improved, actually. It's lowered costs for the first time in a very long time in hospitals because we're paying for less as opposed to more. Very interesting, hospital admissions across the U.S. are down 10% over the last two years. Harder to see in a market like this is still growing, but if you go to a market where the population is stable, there have been real declines in admissions across the board. And that means we're doing a good job. We're keeping people out, right? We've still got the migration of surgical activity to outpatient, but we're really beginning to take out medical activity, right? Average community hospital, about 75% of their admissions are medical admissions, which means somebody basically who's got a chronic disease uh, that's in an acute state of some sort, probably was avoidable if we did the right things, and is there basically to try and get back to where they were before the onset of the exacerbation. I'm on a board of three small hospitals in New England, and what I tell them is, uh, if you look at that 75 or 80 percent, about a quarter of those admissions are readmissions. People walked out of the hospital and, 30, and within 30 days were back in the hospital for the same reason. I actually had a member once who didn't make it across the parking lot. They get, they get discharged, they didn't get to their car, and they went back to the hospital. So, now tell me that that deterioration could have happened in 150 feet between them and their car. So. So we're going we're gonna to have very much more serious business, but a quarter of all those medical admissions are readmissions, and we're basically on a course to eliminate readmissions. But if you also think about it, I, I, tell, I tell the hospitals I'm on the board of, the real goal is zero medical admissions. Now, we won't get there, but we can get an awful lot closer than we are today. And the fact is, we're going to see, we do, we do the job, we're going to see hospitals empty out. That's our job. Our job is to move care into the community, uh, to move chronic care into the home and into the community, and ultimately be far less dependent on really acute, expensive, cumbersome resources. So that's, that's, that's the picture I put around uh, Oklahoma Surgery Center, right? That's what are we trying to do? We're trying to say, you, we need you to go to the nearest, safest, uh, most efficient place to get your care. And by the way, it's good for you, it's good for us, it's good for your employer. Let's figure out how to do it. Still needed, very interesting. We still have the hospital business resisting this, but when are we going to get to a single simple posting of all the quality measures now that are publicly reported but never appear in the same place? Right? So for me to look and see, actually, to try and view the quality of a hospital, I have to go five or six different places for statistics that are reported by the hospital and, and public record. 
You know, why aren't we collecting those statistics, putting them in a single place that somebody can go use their tablet and say, what do I need to know about Presbyterian Hospital before I go there? And finally, we've got to get out. I've never been a big fan of this. The carriers love this, that they actually keep score about quality. There's nothing more idiotic than a carrier keeping score. One, they know absolutely nothing about quality. Basically, if you've ever called customer service at a carrier, you can tell that quality isn't, isn't job one. Right? <laughs> but beyond that, all they see is a sliver of what goes into any facility, whether it's Keith's or anybody else's. And that sliver really doesn't make sense to generalize any quality perceptions around that. We need, ultimately need people keeping their own quality statistics, having them audited once, having them reported in the same place. And we need to get there as fast as we can get there. Just to lay out, we won't talk a lot today about private exchanges, but, but ultimately we're gonna, we're gonna do a variety of things with employers. The first is, say there are low cost places to get this stuff, and by the way, you ought to buy in and you ought to buy in big. And that is, that's what we call smart choice, but that is transparency, that is you look, up the, look up the price that's on the web, and that's the deal. And by the way, for, our, for the way we've constructed our, uh, our insurance activities, we waive deductibles and copays for anybody who's ready to go to that for two reasons. One is deductibles and copays are a big pain in the butt if you're a provider, right? You think about the amount of money you spend trying to collect them. It's, a, it's a, probably half of what you actually would get in copays you spend just trying to collect them, right? The other thing is, even a minor surgical event in a high deductible plan, and of course, everybody except for government has a high deductible plan today, right? So it's a, it's a great, you can't talk to anybody who's in the government because they think you're speaking Greek to them or something. But the fact is, for somebody to go in, even with a minor surgical procedure early in the year, they're talking two or three grand out of pocket to get out of that surgical procedure. And two or three grand is a lot tougher to collect from somebody than $25, right? And it also, one of the great statistics I use all the time, 61% of all the credit defaults, credit card credit defaults in the United States are over hospital bills, right? So we gotta get out of that business. We, I've known very few people over time who really have surgery for fun. And if you tell them it's free, they're not likely to have another one too, so. Uh, and the fact is, even if they do, if you're dealing with the right people, they won't do it to them, even if they wanted it, so. Uh, so that's, we've we got to get to that point where we've made, we've made medicine a lot more expensive because we've now foisted expense onto the employee, but you recognize for a, for a person with health care needs, it's not affordable. You're actually putting them at financial risk. Uh, and that financial risk is an every year risk for anybody who's got a significant condition. You know, I had a, we, we, we sold a company a long time ago, a Medicaid company to Aetna that became the Aetna Medicaid division. I had a young gal, 35-year-old gal who worked for me who had juvenile arthritis. Single mom, very common in these, right? And she had to take a shot every other month that cost $1,250. As soon as we went to the Aetna health plan, she had to borrow the money to pay for her two shots every year because that was the deductible. Right? So here you got a single mom making 40-something thousand dollars a year using credit card debt to pay for her shot. And the fact is, if she didn't get that shot, she would have been disabled. She could not have come to work. Right? So what a silly kind of system to end up in. So private exchanges, there's a lot of, a lot of confusion about that. There are a lot of many brokers will tell you, well, private exchange is how I sell you dental and uh, uh, insurance and vision insurance and uh, uh, Aflac-like products and whatever else, and, that's in, and you use an exchange to do that, but a private exchange really has given people a choice between do you want the company's plan or do you want a different plan, right? And I do think you'll see, see places like us. I have, I have employees in about 30 states, but I only have a, about five states where I really have enough employees to have a self-insured plan and be able to manage it. So I'm gonna figure out how to use exchanges basically to, to lever my risk in those other states and ultimately, you'll see, in Native American tribes have figured this out already, they have more special exemptions than you ever can imagine, but they can basically isolate risk for people who are very high-risk individuals. So my prediction, ultimately, on the exchanges is they already have features of, of a high-risk pool. You know, all the states at one time had high-risk pools. They're all kind of gerrymandered attempts to, 
take care of people who fell through the cracks. But ultimately, you see exchanges that really serve two purposes, people who need individual insurance who are basically healthy, and a high-risk pool that ultimately ought to be managed by a single entity and ought to be somebody who actually manages risk for a living. Uh, so it's going to be an interesting, and, and you're going to see the market devolve to that, I think, relatively quickly as people figure out how to get risk. If you think about an employer, they ultimately want to take big chunks of risk off their income statement. You know, I, I get somebody who comes in today who's taken the new, the, the new non-statin statin, and it's going to cost $30,000 a month for the rest of this person's life, which has now been extended <laughs> by eight or ten years. Why am I in that business? I, I've got no leverage to negotiate that price. And ultimately, prices of unleverageable things really ought to be determined, it ought to be a government program that says we're going to figure out how we're going to buy this and who's going to qualify to get it. It doesn't make sense to, be, to ask individual employers to be figuring that problem out for themselves. Let's talk about trans transparency is, is, is the, um, it, is in the end, the starting point for all of this stuff, right? The first thing we got to do is open the kimono, right? We got to say, here it is. This is warts and all. This is the healthcare system. And what's really weird about the healthcare system is everybody has a transparent price except privately employed persons, right? All the government programs, I mean, they may, the prices are, you can figure out the price even if they don't tell you. Uh, they're all fixed, basically, the methodology to do them. And the only part of the business is where somebody's actually paying for it, you can't get the price. Instead, you get a 10-page bill, and the challenge is if you have trouble sleeping, and apparently Adam does, they, you read the bill, and pretty soon you're asleep because it has nothing to do with what actually happened to you in the place. Uh, but if you think about price competition, Transparency is where competition starts. It doesn't finish there, but you have to have, just, just I mean, use that same Walmart example, walking around Walmart and none of the, none of the prices are posted on the shelf, right? I mean, who's gonna do that, right? And what makes it a powerful combination is the prices are right there. They'll tell you about the prices anytime. Uh, they don't fiddle with the prices every day, right? It's, uh, uh, it's really pretty, and if you think about how much cost has been driven out of that business for things that we buy from Walmart over the past 10 years? Here's a simple indicator. When I started in healthcare, we spent about $300 per person per year on healthcare in the US, and this year we'll spend close to 10,000. So I'd be the first one to admit healthcare is a lot better, but that's a really big increase. <laughs> and the fact is, Great Britain spends about 5,000. Uh, and the only difference is people in Great Britain live about three years longer than we do. So, I had a, 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 a former governor of the state of Montana once said, he said, I got to be governor and the first thing I found out is I spend more money on health care than on everything else combined. I spend $2 billion a year on health care and I didn't know anything about it. So he said, I called up my, my colleague and who's the governor general in Winnipeg, I said, how much are you spending on health care? about the same population, and the, and the governor general responded, well, I spend about a billion dollars. And this guy says, we better sit down and figure this out. <laughs> so, uh, and that's exactly the state we're in, though. We've got to sit down, we've got to say, where are we going to get it cost? Simple example, Partners Healthcare, probably one of the most expensive places anywhere uh, to buy health. A lot of good things about it. 60% of admissions don't need to go there, right? Because it's at a level of service that really isn't required for the, for the kind of service that's being provided. And yet we put all those admissions into that place, we pay a price that's probably quadruple what a community hospital price would be, right? And all of it done without, it's a secret, and we'll let you know later on how much you owe us. So we think about, tra and transparency is exactly what's been accomplished here. It's the, it's the numbers, it's on a page, it's referenceable, right? It's not a negotiation, and it lets people shop. And for the first time, we really need to let people shop for healthcare and to take away all the fuzziness around it. And as is typical, uh, price and quality are not correlated, right? Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. And the fact is, it's tremendous range of services in a community. And the fact is, quality, quality occurs all across that range. And the hard part is finding quality and then finding a price that actually fits that quality. 
Talk about, so there'll be a lot of discussion here, and you'll see the big guys in this market, both Mercy and Baptist, will all talk about we're going to take risk and we're going to get better at doing this. Uh, and if you really want your grandchildren to experience the savings that comes from that, it's like, go ahead and do it. But, you know, you're putting, you're putting the inmates in charge of the asylum, right? They're in a high-cost model. Uh, just have a conversation with anybody who runs a hospital about low-cost site of service. Right? It, I mean, they look at you as if you're speaking a different language, right? Because the fact is, if you take an ambulatory surgery uh, facility inside a hospital, one, it probably operates at about double the cost of a freestanding surger, surgical center. Its productivity is sub substantially less than the same freestanding surgery center. And even if they charged you what it cost them, it would cost you more than double what you're going to pay across the street. Right? So what, what's the chance, not only are we going to, we're going to drive it to a low-cost facility, but we're actually going to achieve what low-cost can be achieved. Very difficult to be really efficient in great big buildings. You know, if, if you put a, put a $2 a square foot activity in $10 space, it's never going to be cheap again. So. So it's, uh, uh, and I think the way I picture this today, we're, we're, we're now the dike is leaking, and, and all we have to hope is, is the insurers and the, pay, and the, and the big uh, providers just run out of fingers to plug the dike. They're gonna hate, they hate what's happening, right? And yet it's beginning to happen really almost every place in the US. And the only question is how do you get to scale? How do you get it so it's enough that it really begins to become a dominant influence on the market? We're very close, I think, to that tipping point in this market today, right? It's, it's now everybody's talking about it. We, but we still have payers who say, I don't want you to do that. Cigna is, refuses to make their network available with somebody who's making, uh, making fixed price, bundled price work available, right? And you go, why would you, why would you ever want to do that? And the reason is because they're not in charge. Right? And, and they're imagining, and, and one of their big hospital friends may yell at them, right? Because they probably will. And, and, uh, and I, always, I always consider that, that's my sign of success is when somebody calls and yells because somebody went down the street for a better deal, so. <laughs> Making healthcare work for consumers. And we've just, you know, we're just, one is, and I imagine you all have looked at that great website already that Keith has. But why isn't all of healthcare like that? Why don't I go on, on site and see a simple list? Why can't I make an appointment? I know who to call, whatever it is, just doing that, right? Because there's really nothing that happens in healthcare that can't be done exactly that way, right? I mean, there are big, complicated things. Uh, that happen in academic medical, medical centers? The answer is yes, but you know, that's a pretty small, if you, it's a sliver of the activity in the healthcare world, not in terms of dollars, but in terms of frequency and in terms of the number of people who are, who are impacted by it. Everything else, I mean, the pharmacy world got to this level of transparency 15 years ago, right, by standardizing, right? And everybody codes the same way, everybody processes a bill the same way, and the fact is, it's a, it's, it sits there in stark contrast to how the rest of healthcare works. Because the rest of healthcare actually works to obfuscate pricing information as opposed to share it. So we need to, it seems to me we have to begin that process of saying, I want that present every place I look and I touch the healthcare system. And everybody who does it should have a market advantage in terms of where it ends up at the end of this path, right? It is time to be, to take a chance and to say, I'm gonna put myself out there, and by the way, if this market's gonna evolve as I think it's gonna evolve, I wanna be part of the solution. I don't wanna be trying to fix it, trying to pretend I was part of the solution 10 years from now when the rules have changed. And that's where the carriers are gonna be. The carriers are gonna drag their feet on this thing till the last possible moment, and then they're gonna announce they invented it. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> But it's a great challenge. Uh, one of the things we're working on now is how do we actually automate the, uh, what we're, we're now calling an e-ticket, uh, uh, e which is how do we go from member to appointment to authorization uh, to report that the service has been provided to payment without ever creating a piece of paper? How do we make it a credit card transaction? I've been trying to do this in healthcare for 40 years. 
why doesn't healthcare, why don't healthcare payments work just like MasterCard, right? Why don't you, you know, and basically all three elements are exactly the same. You figure out whether somebody has a MasterCard that's valid, right? Uh, you actually report about the amount of money they're going to spend, and it gets approved. You process the payment. And there's no reason healthcare can't be exactly the same way, right? And, and that means it doesn't, it doesn't need paper, it doesn't need a four-page list of all the different kinds of pills somebody left on your table while you were there. And it ultimately, we, our goal is I've already designed the receipt that goes back to the member that says, thank you, bill paid in full, and it says you had one knee replacement, right? And that's all that needs to be said. And, uh, uh, and I'll tell you, you're gonna see people's attitudes towards healthcare change dramatically. Anybody who's been through this, all you have to do is listen to what the experience was like. We, we just tell, just go back and tell your employers about this. And the stories are already legion in this town. And the only real challenge for us is to see if we can make them legion in a whole bunch of towns. So, uh, but it's a, it's a fan. And ultimately, we've got to see, you know, physicians' offices are going to have to get there to the same place. Uh, we've, got to, we've got to realize that ultimately what we know about the healthcare business really should be in electronic health records and not in claims anyways. Claims really aren't very much use in terms of understanding what's going on with patients or large groups of patients. Uh, but the fact is the electronic records we, we now maintain for patients are going to get better and better and they're really going to be based in physicians offices and in hospitals and places where people receive care, not in insurance companies. So I think we're there. It's, let's, go, let's go to the who, what, and where. So this, we're in a, I think we're in the era of the biggest change in healthcare that any of us has seen, right? Now, I've always, I've always guessed that things were going to change faster than they actually changed. So you're, and you probably, I, a very good thing, I, I don't bet on the stock market because things take forever to change. And then, of course, they change a lot more than you wanted them to. Uh, but you've got to believe um, that we are in a world where, uh, at least as it relates to outpatient services, within five years, we're going to have a discernible national market. Uh, Within five years, we're going to see uh, what I would say is real medical tourism is people going from really expensive, obnoxious places to get care, like New York, someplace else. Right? I mean, explain to me if you have a, have a lot of personal liability, why you always don't leave California to get care. Right? It's extraordinarily expensive. It's really actually not very good. Uh, and the fact is you can go to Phoenix, you can go to Salt Lake City, you could go, you can go to Colorado and all get better, cheaper, and certainly friendlier care than, than you can get in some of these locations. So we're going to, I do think we're going to see, there's been a lot of theorizing by employers about foreign medical tourism, which I don't think is going to happen very much, but I do think there's going to be a tremendous amount of opportunity to become health centers, regional health centers for people to come and get a kind of care an immediacy of relationship that they just can't get some other way. And so it's, uh, it will be, an, I mean, just think of it today. We've got people coming from virtually every state except for Hawaii to Oklahoma City, and again, not the easiest place to get to, but they're coming here for an experience they can't buy someplace else. And in fact, when they do buy it someplace else, it costs them a lot more money and they don't actually get what they were trying to buy. So, uh, so it's, a, it's gonna, I think, gonna be a very big opportunity to begin to move people, just invite people to visit places that have great reputations that are transparent and open and ready to do the business. So we, I, I see institutional healthcare. My goal is it, is it needs to decompress, right? We need less of it, and we need to say how much money can and should be spent outside the, outside the walls to actually minimize what needs to be spent inside the walls. And it's, uh, you know, our, our grandparents, uh, only went to the hospital to die. We're going to figure out how to not even to go to a hospital to do that anymore, which is a pretty good thing, right? Uh, but ultimately, chronic disease, we're going to fight the chronic disease battle at home and in the community, and we're not going to fight it in hospitals. And that's going to make this a different healthcare system than it's been for a long time. So we, this is like, how do we start getting there from here? Uh, and really, the choice, is, is, I think, is a simple one. Uh, do, do we give the money and the authority to, to hospitals and big insurers who are about as cozy with big hospitals as you can imagine, right? Even though they complain about them all the time, 
It's like somebody complaining about the wife they've been married to for 45 years, and they never are outside of each other's presence, but you know, they all have complaints that they're more than happy to voice. Uh, or, or are you going to actually take that money and spend it outside the system with people who show that they're ready to do it responsibly? And that's Keith Smith, and that's places like uh, Surgery Center of Oklahoma. Uh, and ultimately, my job is, uh, has to be to be a facilitator of that change. We've we got to make it available to people. We've got to let them touch it and feel it. Uh, we've got to help them tell their stories. Uh, we got to let employers celebrate. You know, think, think about, we insure lots of, we've got employers at 50 employees taking self-insurance, and Adam would tell you, tell you that 10 years ago, people would have thought you were insane to try and self-insure self at 50. But what, what do employers find? One is, the kind of insurance quotes they get are so high, basically, you get an insurance quote that assumes you, you, you hit your aggregate spend, right, which is, 10 or 15 or 20 percent more than you'd expect to spend in that group and you're going to pay a premium so you don't have to worry about it basically. But it's very, very expensive. So they have to take the chance. All right? The only reason employers ever go self-insured is one, they want to understand exactly what they're spending and the carriers play hide and seek forever. It's their data, not your data. And two, the only way they can really save money is to influence the spend and they can't influence the spend in an insured situation, right? Because everything's out of their hands. Uh, so you're going to see that you're going to see more of that, that, that self-insurance is going to be endemic in the environment and everybody who understands that I have to figure out health care for my business to thrive uh, is going to be in that side of the business. And we got to help them do it particularly well. Uh, the hospitals will warn you, listen, we need this money to pay for sick people or poor people or whatever. And there's only one possible response to that. That's not my problem. Right? If I sit there and worry about solving your problem, we're not going to solve this one. And the fact is, if you shrink, uh, I'm more than happy to have a civic community discussion about what level of academic medicine we need and how much there needs to be in this community and what really needs to be inside the four walls. But it's not a discussion you're ready to have today. But I'm ready to have it. <laughs> so I'm going to stop at that. Thank you. But it's, uh, it's going to be, I, if you don't see this happening all over the place in the next couple of years, we blew it. Right, because the you know the fire the fire has started. Uh, certainly hasn't been any rain in my part of the world. So, and uh, uh, and the fact is, really extraordinary uh, outcomes for members. You know, people who are making their mortgage payment this month who wouldn't have made their mortgage payment. Uh, people who are having Christmas and wouldn't have had Christmas otherwise. Employers who are saving startling amounts of money and getting something better than what they were buying with a lot more money just a year ago. So thank you. <laughs>